So last time, I don't know if you remember, uh, we talked about uh, the use of music in cinema uh, to actually uh, specify what was the, the word that the author was using? It was not specify, but... Go on, real lightness. <laughs> Go on, tell us. No, nobody. We're going to find it. And so, so the idea was that um, you, can, you can set, I guess, uh, some kind of idea, a theme, with images and um, and text, but music, maybe maybe uh, Rosa was pushing it, pushing the argument a bit too far in that direction. But let's take it. Let's try to understand it at least. Music was enabling a specification of the mood. It's not just sadness, but it's this specific sadness that goes with the music. Yeah. And um, I was myself pushing the argument very far when I was uh, talking towards the end of the class. I think I was carried away in my thoughts and uh, saying that music was uh, such an important thing. I'm not sure music will save the world, but the, the argument I was trying to make was that if we agree on the main argument of Rosa, that the kind of modernity in which we are living with screens, with uh, this uh, work you can do uh, fr from a distance on your computer, etc. With the uberization of work as well, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. with the noise we we know in our in our supermarkets, in our cities, etc., uh, create a kind of silence and noise at the same time. The silence that Bart was um, targeting as a bad thing for the soul and the noise that um, Hampton was targeting as a problem of civilization that that makes us uh, become unhealthy becomes um, stressful people able to uh, do more bad things uh, some kind of repercussion on our behavior. So if this diagnosis, if this diagnosis is correct, uh, it goes as well with other things we talked about during the this uh, um, session, uh, not session, but series of sessions. Um, it it goes with commodification. Mm -hmm. And that's why I posted um, a few films. Uh, the, um, mostly, I think uh, the, 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 f the thing that I think is the most interesting for us in terms of commodification is the, um, the one called um, A Story We Missed You, hmm. which is the la latest, um, the latest uh, film by Ken Loach, and uh, it's about. Have you seen it? Have you guys seen it? I saw um, a, a, an extract, possibly not this one, because I actually was in a uh, thing like this with Ken Loach around three weeks ago. Oh, cool! So, so I saw him. I saw him because <laughs> he's a, a trade unionist like me. So I did actually see the man. I didn't ask yeah. him about his films, but I saw him. Uh, how about Sneha and James? Have you seen the movie? No. So we no, I haven't. So it's a stressful movie. Uh, don't watch it on a night you're already stressed. And if, <laughs> uh, if you need to unwind, don't watch it. If you can take it one day, it's a very beautiful movie on family life in 
uh, or modernity, which uses people as agents uh, to bring uh, stuff, to bring merchandise as fast as possible to people who, uh, to the homes of pe other people. And so you, you know that, of course, from Amazon, from uh, FedEx, DHL, and other companies. And the, those guys who do this work, um, I guess some of them are treated better than others, but you see, at least in this movie, that um, the uberization of work, the idea that you are your own master with your, with your own vehicle, uh, with your decisions about how you manage your, your career, etc., uh, has bad consequences that are hidden. Um, which is that you become um, subtly um, one of the pieces of a machine. We've all, all already talked about that. They make it as if your agentivity, as if your role as an actor is augmented by the fact that you work uh, on your own. Uh, but actually, um, and that's, that's more uh, in the, you cannot see it so much with FedEx for sure, because the people who work for FedEx or Amazon, they, they actually work for the company, they are company's employees, but there are other companies that use uh, such uh, uh, commercial strategy, uh, which we call Uberization, as you may know. And um, so, um, what I'm trying to say is that it's a form of commodification of the agents themselves. Yeah. You become uh, a piece, uh, you're used as a robot, more or less, a, a very intelligent robot, maybe, but a robot that has to do tasks as, as quickly as possible. Uh, it's, not, it's not that new, but I guess the process with uh, the Uber Uberization has emphasized that trend that already existed in Fordism. Fordism made it clear, but here it's the same thing, but secretly, uh, secretly. Uh, and I think the movie shows it very well. Um, to put to yeah, some uh, Sneha, you wanted to say something? Oh no, I didn't. No, 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 sorry. I wanted to say something just very yeah. quickly. Yeah. What what do you find out about Ken Loach when I when he spoke three weeks ago? Was that he did make a comment on his films? He said, "Look, because there was him and the writer of I Daniel Blake, for instance, which was the film before that." And Ken Loach now is is more like uh, he, he's he's the guy that sits back a bit and looks at the screenplay and sees if it works. There's an actual writer who's a Scottish guy who was talking about all of this, um, and uh, just understanding how the economy works and thinking how appalling it was and how they kept in contact with the people that they observed. So, for instance, um, in in this film about um, the uberization of of uh, lorry drivers or van drivers uh, they they worked with them for eight or nine weeks before to see how quickly they had to go you know for going yeah. toilet breaks this that and the other just to keep on going to make the money that they needed and it's exactly mm -hmm. as you say and as as the film demonstrates it, it is highly it's um it's a very it's a sad indictment of um, British working culture that there's more and more of these people. Yeah. And uh, we, we, uh, we noted that as well. We, we made some remark about it when we were commenting the crisis of the, the COVID crisis and the delivery guys, you know, the delivering uh, mo motorcycle guys who were taking the risks for other people. 
and um, so that was the first point I was trying to make, uh, first example, if you wish, uh, to to put the um, this uh, in a perspective that goes even uh, with a, a film that goes even further. It's sorry to bother you. Almost the same title, interestingly. Not sorry we missed you, but sorry to bother you. Has there any one of you seen that film? The, this film? No. No. So it's way more funny. Uh, it's way funnier and fun. It's very fun to watch. Uh, there are things I must uh, warn you that are a little bit um, scary. Um, yet. Um, I, I, I will try not to spoil it by saying much about it, but what I want to say is, as uh, Sorry We Missed You demonstrated that in, in a, uh, contrarily to what it looks, the agentivity is not helped by uberization. Uh, this film, Sorry to Bother You, is questioning uh, transhumanity, the idea of becoming transhuman creatures, even further. Um, to the, how can we be even more efficient mm -hmm. at tasks such as uh, working at a call center, for instance, working with telemarketing? How can we be even more efficient uh, in many tasks that we do as human, as human beings, maybe in a mediocre way compared to the ideal potential? Well, and there, there's this idea that with biology, with computerization of our um, lives, we could transform ourselves to make us even more efficient. Scary. Uh, there is here, and with the movie before, a consequence that that we can name. And so uh, I'm coming to my uh, uh, the conclusion of my introduction, if you will, which is uh, a form of reification and derealization. Reification is an, another word for commodification, if you will. Reification is when you treat people or animals uh, or living beings as things, as lifeless things. Re reification. Like it comes from the Latin res, like you have it in res publica, republic. It means thing. Res means thing, as in lifeless thing. And reification is considering you as something that doesn't have, is not important. Your, your life doesn't matter. Your life doesn't matter. So it's close to commodification, yet commodification is one step further in the sense that commodification is the idea of turning you or something into a merchandise. Um, and in a sense, that's what uh, the uberization and modern societies uh, trying to make us as efficient as possible is doing, because it's selling our services as um, the most efficient service, and therefore we are becoming a product. So reification that goes as far as commodification that's one point. And the other point I, I mentioned, which is that is um, alienation or um, there's another word for that. Sorry, uh, um, derealization. De so let, let's say very simply that the purpose of this book and the purpose of that philosophy, uh, to say broadly, is to understand happiness in relationship, in, in terms of relationship of the people or subjects, if you will, to the world, to the outside world. And resonance 
is when this relationship is qualitatively good, very good, it resonates. And when it's not good at all, when there is on one part the subject that is all isolated and the world that seems to be something ugly, uh, not, not attractive, not, not interesting, then you have what you can call alienation or dereal derealization. Um, derealization is actually alienation one step further. As you had uh, reification and commodification one step further, um, why why is it that derealization is one step further? It's because you can fall with the technologies etc. in a in a trap, which is that you forget about reality. You become I, I take the the easiest example you become absorbed so much in video games that you don't care anymore about nature. It's a form of derealization. And I know the argument. What kind of counter argument can, can you make here? Um, well, we were told last week by Jilly that in actual fact, um, it can still be a form of communication video games because exactly. you could well be uh, speaking to people on the other side of the world and then therefore being more in the world, if you like, exactly. as a result. But exactly. um, I suppose it, it, it depends where you are within your stages of development as to how you can cope with that because it can saturate you, I would imagine. Yeah, and you can go to a point where everything you do, you do through, through a screen even love, yeah, even yeah. sex, even love. And you have an example of that with the movie Her uh, by Spike Jones, which is here. A 2013 movie, excellent movie. I highly recommend it if you haven't seen it. Has anyone seen it? It sounds familiar. It's with Joaquin Phoenix, who, yeah, falls, yeah. In, who falls in love with, uh, I, I don't want to say too much. But I think you understood already what yeah. I meant. Yeah, even the title kind of gives it away to a certain extent. Or at least the image that's there. Yeah. And yeah, it's the... quite an evocative image, you're right. So I, I'm gonna say it, he falls in love with an artificial intelligence. You also have such an idea with the in the movie Ex Machina that you may might have seen as well. The difference is that in Ex Machina, the artificial intelligence has a body, whereas in her, it has only a voice. But then you could almost think about um, Blade Runners having that kind of quality too going back to the 80s, just purely if we were to talk about film, I'm not saying that, it, but you do Which get film? Um, Blade Runner. Blade Runner. Oh, yeah, Blade Runner, of course. Of course. And yeah. also humans. Um, and one of the, um, yeah, he's a human, I had to think first. <laughs> one of the humans falls in love with the ultimate um, conscious robot. Or, mm. or tries to put the concept of the conscious computer into a, a human robot mm -hmm. that has consciousness. And that's quite interesting too. Exactly. And I don't know if you saw the sequel of, uh, of Blade Runner 2049. Not yet. Which deals, <laughs> which deals with the, the possibility of uh, I won't spoil the movie, so I'm just going to say yeah. something that shouldn't spoil the movie, which is uh, of something that is transhumanism. Okay. Well, uh, do you mean transhumanism? Uh, sorry, because I came in late and you might have already said it. Does that mean transference of humans to machines? I cannot be more specific about the movie because I, I don't want to spoil the movie to the people. But okay. transhumanism in, in general means uh, 
uh, I guess there are several definitions, sorry, but I, what I mean by it is um, to um, enhance the possibilities of mankind through technology. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Like humans, which is in Netflix. Okay, okay. The movie. So what I propose to do now is with this little introduction through films to go towards the text that we were that we are supposed to work on tonight, uh, which is the one on politics because this one we have in English, and uh, so I'm going to open it in front of your eyes. It's, it's here. And we are going to comment specific moments of this text, which I found particularly interesting to, uh, in terms of our class. So uh, since we haven't heard you yet, Sneha, would you care to read for us? Uh, yeah, sure. Politics, the four voices of democracy. In contrast to love and friendship, the resonant potential of politics remains largely unarticulated in the social imaginary of modernity. The expectations of and longings for resonance of late modern subjects, in particular, are rarely consciously or explicitly directed at the realm of political action. A fundamental cause of this may be the widespread predominance in the cognitive repertoire of modern Western societies of the liber liberal individualistic concept of democracy, according to which politics is first and foremost an often an antagonistic arena for negotiating and settling conflicts of interest, which, with democracy being given the task of channeling the decision process in fair and impartial ways through compromise between and the aggregation of individual interests. From this perspective and the, modern, the mode of relating to the world that politics establishes is a predominantly mute mode in which the aim is to exert, assert or defend one's own interests through election campaigns, coalition building, political debate and lobbying against competing interests. Thank you so much. So again, in this concept of mutism or muteness, that might be the, the best a substantive, sorry, if mutism doesn't really exist. It exists in French. <laughs> uh, mute, muteness. Uh, do you understand the argument, the introduction, the introductory I'm paragraph? Not sure. Even the first bit is a bit weird because it says the resonant potential of politics remains largely unarticulated in the social imaginary of modernity. It's, it, it's not unarticulated. It's very articulated. <laughs> I don't know. It just I, I, It's not to contradict you, Susie, but I, I had a different thought running. And to answer Antoine's question, I think a good example of this is the United States of America. And in terms of how, if you take the last last line, which talks about the aim is to assert or defend one's own interest through election campaigns, coalition building, political debates and lobbying against competing interests. So you know, I, I just get the sense that they're juggernauts, the, you know, whether it be the Democrats against the Republicans, is that it's two big machineries that use democracy to vehicle the ideas and aspirations but in actual fact the actual individual themselves you know unlike back in plato's day where you know you might be in i'm not saying a coliseum but in an amphitheater where you might might be involved in a discussion we ourselves are very much removed from true democracy itself so could that be what, and I know what you mean, Susie, a lot of a lot of it sounds like flowery languages language at the beginning. But in terms of a concept, I think I've got it. Am I right, Antoine? Yeah. Yes, you are. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 yep. Go ahead, Susie. Let me just explain, because I actually missed out the word resonant. 
Mm-hmm. So I said the potential of politics remains largely and I so that's how I read it. I didn't I I I missed that that word resonant, which is a oh, really important word in the sentence. Yeah. And I probably would have read it the same way as you, Scott, if I hadn't have missed that that word. But because yeah. I missed that that word, the whole of the I was I was not hearing, but that's good. That's wonderful. So let's go a bit further because I think we understood the main idea here is that um, in spite of what it should be, uh, a, an area of resonance, politics is no longer that. It's a, it is a place where parties are fighting for their own interests, for their careers. And uh, we are more and more um, cynical. We've become more and more cynical, not in the true sense of the cynic- cyn- cynicism of the antiques, the, the antiquity, but uh, the, the usual, the commonplace word cynical, which means we don't believe anymore in politics somehow. Most of us are like, yeah, it's just a politician. He's always is gonna do for what is most interesting for himself, etc. And uh, I hope it's not the case. I hope we can still make the the sphere of politics resonate, and we can still believe that some of the stakes and um, the fights have meaning, and that we can. Uh, find meaning through supporting such or such figure that uh, is in front line. For instance, uh, I do believe that people such as Elizabeth Warren, um, Bernie Sanders, uh, and younger ones such as uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, etc., um, <coughs> are uh, um, genuine uh, politicians who are uh, making, in some way, with their voices, the the sphere of politics resonate again. So I believe it's not too late, and I believe uh, uh, the 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 time uh, has always been uh, a time. Uh, we've always know with all. Sorry, we've always known times with disbeliefs, and then uh, another uh, uh, moment of belief or resonance, if you will, depending uh, on who the political figures are. Um, I think that a good example, even though she's not particularly a politician um, in name, is uh, Greta. Yeah, no, she um, is totally. You know, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's doing what the what we think politicians should be doing. Yeah, she she made she made the use uh, res, resonate with politics again. That's an excellent example. Thank you. So let's go a bit further into text to 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 go deeper in. Um, uh, I, I just wanted to uh, underline, since it's already in italics, the word mute uh, that we've seen several times, and that in uh, Rosa's text seems to be uh, another open, another, uh, not opponent, but um, oppo- um, sorry, the, the opposite, the opposite of resonance. Muteness as the opposite of resonance. Um, alienation is another opposite that he was using, but here it's muteness. Uh, let's go further, maybe with James reading. Okay. <laughs> the result is a dramatic exacerbation of the problem inherent in the conception of life as a hostile arena of the antagonistic resonanceless relation between the subjects and the institutions or practices of what is called the public sphere. Unlike in antiquity or the Middle Ages, the social and institutional order of the culture of modernity is no longer seen as divinely ordained or spiritually imbued. 
Modern subjects in the course of their everyday lives do not feel that they are part of a meaningfully integrated, resonant order of existence or great chain of being. So that maybe respond. that's familiar to you if you know Shakespeare, if you've studied about Shakespeare's times and or the Middle Ages, the idea of great chain of being is the cosmos as something very organized in which everybody has its own place, na natural, uh, decided by God, which is represented by the king, which is also represented by uh, minor social uh, chiefs uh, a bit like um, the nomads exactly so let's let's go a bit further with that sentence sorry i i interrupted you uh james That's can okay. you see the uh, uh, yeah yeah cool. that responds to them and through which they can define themselves rather they view the collective conditions under which they act as the at least partly contingent outcome of historical constructions and negotiations, and particularly as the outcome of countless conflicts of values and interests, insofar as these conditions limit individual scope of action and range of free choice, we experience them as something external, happened upon heteronomous, i.e. as part of an opposing alienated world, Day to day, we generally experience this kind of relationship to the public sphere whenever we find ourselves fighting with government offices, whether the tax office, department of traffic regulations, employment office or school board, though it also manifests itself whenever and wherever regulations of everyday life are att attributed without further thought to Brussels. So that might re remind you of uh, some debates that were very uh, important in the UK, right? that ended up with the Brexit, I would yeah. say, unfortunately, but I don't know, actually. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, sorry, but it is. <laughs> uh, so so um, another word that's a bit difficult here is heteronomous. Have you, do you know it? No. Uh, it's, it's easy to explain, right? Because hetero means what? Other, as opposed to same, which is homo, and nomus, it's like in economy, it's the rules. So um, something, something that rules you from outside. You can see the political uh, world as such. And I think some people dur during this COVID period that we are going through are seeing the political decisioners as heteronomous. People who take a, a, alien people if you other people that are different and that should not uh, decide for you you see what i mean external people external things that decide for you instead of being uh, you you you're representing figures if you will there was a term they used in england uh, in england because it was mainly england that voted uh, against uh, or voted to leave uh, regarding uh, brexit it was elites mm -hmm. so it was the same idea but you know this idea that there, there are powerful people who kind of um a bit like with um with technocrats the idea of the technocrats exactly exactly and there there are technocrats there there is an elite in some way uh that's not judgmental to say so uh, there is an elite yet um uh, and it's true that they often take decisions that are that are that can feel heteronomous, right? Such as, for instance, Macron is denationalizing most of the things that were common goods, such as right now the electrical um, provider EDF um, is becoming uh, um, um, little by little a private company. And um, there was even a, a, an idea project to make the airports of Paris become private. Although uh, I noticed cetera, that they stopped. Although I noticed that they stopped Antoine when they tried to, uh, when, when it was floated that uh, yeah. Toulouse might want to do the same thing and they found that nobody wanted to buy it. Mm -hmm. 
just as an idea. I don't think it got past that, but it was just an idea that I read at the time around yeah. six, seven months yeah. ago. So the, can you see what is the problem of this chapter? What is the problem we are trying to tackle here? How would you phrase this problem? How would you phrase it? What is the problem? I would say the little man and, and an out of control society and the relationship between the two and how you can bridge that through resonance through certain things and we spoke about music last week yeah how about uh, other dehumanization people? can you say that again dehumanization yeah in a sense yeah but that's not really phrasing the problem i mean i, I see that is it's a concept that could work in the problem but how would you phrase the problem well, the problem of dehumanization is that what once you um once you have that in society then you don't have thoughts and feelings and um voice that is heard and oh, yeah. therefore uh, as scott said the, uh, the big boys take over or girls mm -hmm. and um they're the ones that don't listen to the rest and mm -hmm. therefore cause all sorts of responses in society that will be negative towards uh, whatever regime is trying to take over. Yeah. Uh, if uh, Sneha or James want to add something? No? Um, I, I would say uh, as simply as possible, uh, the problem here is how can you make the sphere of politics that has become mute resonant again? Get them to listen to us for bloody change. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, actually, you, we, we said it earlier, and uh, perhaps perhaps the elites will but listen when there is a vote, and it's a vote against them. And let's face it, capitalism wouldn't have voted for Brexit. Mm, yeah, good point. And uh, there was also this dilemma with the, the independence of Scotland and the idea that uh, one big city, which if I remember right, was uh, Glasgow, voted uh, to stay in the UK? No. Is that <laughs> um, I don't know if Glasgow would. I think Glasgow, some of it is... Uh, Am I confusing? Oh. There was Glasgow and there was Edinburgh. Which one was to was it more likely to be Edinburgh? <laughs> so Edinburgh, because because sure. they are the elite, I guess they wanted to stay. Yeah. And the the people who were most displeased with the UK's politics, which are more the the middle class, if you will, um, which are more represented by Glasgow were in favor of leaving the UK. Working class. The working well, class, sorry. better, better. And so uh, you see these kinds of uh, dilemmas happening. And here, in a sense, uh, the, the stakes resonate, like the people care. You cannot say that they didn't give an F, right? They cared. <laughs> But is it what we mean by resonance? Not yet. And here with this chapter, we're going to see uh, several possibilities of what could be the meaning of resonance in politics. So let's go a bit further into it. Politicians and political institutions. Can somebody go ahead, Scott? Oh, I can't see this sentence. Uh, is this the is that the, is it the the main body of the paragraph politicians and political institutions yeah, yeah, yeah. are representatives of the public sphere so conceived are then often perceived as being indifferent they have no interest in us they don't care about our concerns or even repulsive as when they are accused of only lining their own pockets uh, at the same time politicians themselves frequently represent and conceptualize their own actions as being not responsive 
to a deliberate collective decision making process, but rather as necessarily even compulsively reactive to structural pressures um, to adjust to realities emerging, for example, from the economic sphere. In this respect, at least there is not a whit of difference between Chancellor Gerhard enough Schroeder and Angela, we have no alternative Merkel. The re resonant wire between politics or politicians and citizens thus turn out to be jammed from both ends with each side influencing, impeding and manipulating, but in general, never actually reaching, touching or moving the other. The relationship of representation is rigid hardened and is in no way fluid that's brilliant yeah did you all follow was it uh, understandable so uh, how would you summarize uh, somebody wants to summarize susie or scott well as i as i read it i'll just say two lines i loved the bit where they the chancellor gerhard schroeder who was the ex um german chancellor who was sent sent it was meant to be on the left yeah. and angela merkel who we know is on the right and that if they're saying that there was no real difference then i think that that's telling in itself but we know about that in the in the uk we had tony blair didn't we susie uh yeah i met him <laughs> <laughs> and i'm lucky <laughs> Well, he was a schmoozer. He was definitely a schmoozer, yes. Yeah, but he was very short. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what did you think of the text? Um, I've always come to uh, the conclusion that most politics uh, um, from the left and the right end have very similar behaviour patterns. And... Um, and they can both be as fascist as each other, as far as I'm concerned. But then I have another view that the whole of politics is a bit like that anyway. <laughs> and I'm not very impressed with politicians because of the institutions, because the institutions are in place. So the decision making's in place and it's not for the people like it should be so yeah. that's my opinion whether it actually goes with um, what these guys are saying mm -hmm. it sounds like it does because it says there's not a weight of difference between the chancellors yeah, yeah the yeah. resonant wire between politics mm. i think if we try like to... yeah go ahead it it none of these politicians are touching us properly uh, you know we're not touched in in the sense that we should be touched you know they're putting our lives in their hands and they are not actually interested in our lives okay. they're interested in the concept but not our lives really so uh, and to summarize uh, this uh, this paragraph by uh, you know with um, philosophical method that's very simple we could use uh, we could just uh, grasp the 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 little concepts that he used mm -hmm. and they are very easy to grasp because they are put in italics um, we have uh, the word indifferent mm -hmm. which work again as an opposite to resonance indifference and uh, that goes with this idea of indifference or even a step further is repulsive. And then uh, what, what is it, uh, what is repulsive, the, the opposite of that you can find afterwards, responsive. And if we go a bit further in uh, what's going with responsive, it's interesting. So it gives you an idea of what a resonant kind of politics can be. Responsive to what? Responsive to, what? Responsive to a deliberative collective decision-making process. 
And so what is the opposite of that? That would be resonance in politics. It is when they are reactive instead of responsive, they are reactive. So they are not really agents, political agents. They are just like uh, organisms that can't think, you know? They just react to something that happened. And, uh, and uh, uh, reaction is two different things, because it, it can mean, if, if someone's um, showing a response, you can react to that response in two different ways, good or bad. So reactive, yes, it can mean the opposite, but it can also mean um, co-active. I, you think, know, I uh, think you're totally right, except that here, I think he has this paradigm. Yeah, the opposite. Between, where, yeah, responsive, that's good. That's when you actually act as a politician that's matured uh, your thoughts, etc. Et and responsive is like, oh, it's not, I'm just doing my work here. I'm, I'm just doing what I should be doing. I have, I don't have any decision making in the process. And reactive to what? To structural pressures to adjust to realities emerging, etc. For example, from the economic sphere. And he, yes, here it's not difficult to imagine that we have the pressure of financial markets on political actors that make political actors be just uh, the, how would you say? Yeah, the performers, the performers of what uh, the, the market wants. What's interesting as well with some of our politicians is that they're involved in the financial market and businesses, which uh, and they actually um, promote um, work for their businesses through their political status. And that is so absolutely not on. But it's actually quite obvious. I, I, I think in, in lots of ways, it's what is sometimes hidden and which has become apparent over the last 10 years, which actually is more flagrant, is that we can see that the, just when they say about the, talk about the economic sphere there, is, is about how, never mind how the private has, has, has a private, how, how politicians could be businessmen that then become, say, presidents like Trump, for instance, mm -hmm. but how the public, how the public sphere is now becoming private. Uh, as in, if the central bank's mission now is to print money to give but to the to the to the banks or to the businesses directly, then mm -hmm. this idea of the resonant wire, it's completely gone. Because as, as I think it was uh, Piketty said, um, that one way that you could do it is just do helicopter money. Why not just throw it out of a plane, but throw it to the people directly to spend in the shops? They don't choose to do that. So it's almost like the system is not for the individual. It's not for us. It's like you said earlier, Antoine, through the mechanism of the, of the delivery, the Uberization, is that we but serve the system rather than the system actually help us. I think and also, also on top of that, if they're giving money indirectly to people in that way, then they can claim how much money they've given and then do taxes and stuff like that. If you put it yeah. out in a helicopter, you're not going to know who's got what. So mm -hmm. they want to be in complete control of mm -hmm. the financial side. Um, so that they can come back on us later and wham us, <laughs> especially when Brexit doesn't work. <laughs> Antoine? Yes, yeah. Um, I had a question on the last sentence, the resonant wire between politics or politicians and citizens thus turning out to be jammed from both ends with each side influencing, impeding and manipulating, but, gen but in general, never actually reaching, touching or moving the each other. The relationship of representation is rigid, hardened, and almost no way fluid. So I don't understand why, how come he's contrasting two different sentences, but one he's saying that we're actually 
manipulating each other. But on the other hand, he's saying, no, they are hard in their strategy. They are not moving. So, and yeah, I'm, I'm a bit confused in that sentence. So, I'm I'm just gonna comment this this sentence in general, and then I'm going to try to tackle your question. So, uh, this sentence goes very well with the whole project of the book, which is not to study uh, something as a substance, but to study a relationship. And here we have the idea of the relationship with wire, the resonant wire and the, the, um, the adverb that gives the idea of relationship between, between politics or politicians and citizens. Here is the idea again of better, uh, a betterment, uh, enhancing uh, a relationship and enhancing which relationship? The relationship between the people that represent uh, the, the, the people that represent the people and the people represented. Uh, so now I'm trying to go towards your questions, to, toward your question. Uh, this turns out to be jammed from both ends. So jammed, I feel that it's the opposite of a good relationship, right? Am I right? With each side influencing, impeding, and manipulating, but in general, never actually reaching, touching, or moving the other. Yeah. So I think he's saying that there is a relationship, but it's not a relationship that is as... Um, qualitatively good as it could be, as it should be in terms of, of politics. It's not because, a relationship that's resonating. <laughs> yeah, like manipulating, uh, uh, we know that uh, through uh, different uh, techniques, uh, speech techniques and other, other ones, uh, commercials, etc., campaigns, money, uh, the, the politicians are trying to manipulate us to vote for them or to, to think like they do, etc. Uh, influence, impede. So I, I give you an example of uh, impediment. Recently in France, I don't know if you noticed, but there were a lot of protests. And uh, each time there were protests, there, there were the, the armed forces tr trying to maintain order. Um, which is more or less a way of impeding democracy because uh, most of these protests were peaceful uh, manifestations of, of uh, expression of dissatisfaction with the way uh, the ho hospitals are run, for instance. Uh, I remember the most shocking, in my eyes, the most shocking uh, protest was when the people working in the hospitals were actually asking for more means to tackle the situation before and during COVID. Mm -hmm. And they uh, were, um, they were um, violently um, taken care of. Wow. wow. So I think... Also, uh, the other thing is secret laws that the politicians passed in COVID to stop people's human rights. There's been a lot of laws passed, you know, because we've been so taken up quite rightly on the COVID situation. We've missed a lot of laws getting passed that actually impede our own humanity. Yeah. So I, I, to co come back to the sentence, I don't think the sentence is contradictory. When I read it again, I don't see it as uh, contradicting itself because I see the idea that there is a relationship, but a bad one. And, um, and the, the terms is using to say that this relate to describe why it's bad are influencing instead of reaching impeding instead of 
touching and manipulating instead of moving the other. So I see here just um, uh, what it's the what it is compared to what should be, if you want. First, first line, what what the relation is, and below what the relationship should be. Did I answer your question more or less? Uh, yes, thank you, Anton. You're so welcome. I think it, I think I thank you for that because you broke down the actual sentence, but it 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 is more, isn't it? it it's that I don't know if they're ever designed to actually, perhaps it's an ad man's game, you know? I think there was a good book on this called Propaganda by um, the, um, yeah, the nephew the, of Freud. Yeah. Yeah, who kind of spoke about, who, who might have been on a certain wavelength with this. Well, it was used by the Nazis, I think, or uh, I, I don't remember. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, it's a famous book. Let's yeah. go. Let's go a bit further. <coughs> uh, this conceptualization of the public sphere, Susie. This con conceptualization of the public sphere represents a fundamentally problematic stage of the decline of the democratic order. The great promise of democracy, which over the course of more than two centuries has become a word of yearning, a long for goal, even a way of life, as per likes of John Dewey and Alexei de Tocqueville, and which even today elicits mass excitement in many locations around the world. It's simply of public life can be transformed and adapted in and through the medium of democratic politics and that their ruling representatives can be made responsive to their subjects to the extent that modernity is defined by the fundamental idea that the people themselves are able to determine the social, political and economic order and thus democratically shape the society in which they live and act. They are able to experience disorder as a responsive sphere of resonance and adopt it as their own. Thank you. In the a, a, a little pause here, because I think this sentence is very important um, to um, summarize how uh, Rosa and others uh, see modernity and conceptualize it. So modernity is defined by the fundamental idea that the people themselves are able to determine the social, political, and economic order, etc. So this idea is the opposite of the term that we've seen above, the adjective, which was when you ruled by something external. What was the adjective? I'll go with you what your, what your wife said. <laughs> Do you remember what, what the, the adjective was? Heteronymous. Heteronymous is the exact opposite of this idea, the fundamental idea that the people themselves are able to determine, determine the social, political, and economic order. Right. So um, what's homonymous? Homonymous is... No, 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 wait. Het yeah. Heteronymous, like hetero, right. like... A, heterosexual and nomos like nomi in economy but it's os in the end it, uh, o u s because it's an adjective and you can actually uh, use the substantive which is heteronomy see have we ever really had this <laughs> no 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 it's an idea it's, a, it's what idealism is about. It's creating something that doesn't exist yet. 
And it's why when people criticize a bit uh, naively idealism, they don't understand that uh, an um, idealism is not naive necessarily. Oh, thank you for uh, saying that, because I've been accused of being an idealist all my life. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, the idea, actually, to that to act, you need to set yourself a goal. And to set yourself a goal, you need to envisage an idea of how, should, uh, how things should be. That's what Kant's uh, philosophy is about. What is utopianism then? U utopianism is a part of that, indeed. Right. Okay. Very, very good point. Uh, so is we made a, a pause here to notice that modernity, in other words, is an idea of man, of mankind, if you will with uh, associated to uh, the idea of augmenting the, the self-determination. Modernity, if you will, you can, you can uh, put equals the, 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 the arrow that goes towards up, the, uh, that goes high, self-determination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Uh, and um, the the thing is that to create that, to create an augmentation of self determination, you have to first have the political conditions in which uh, people can determine themselves. And that's why we have the idea of democracy. Isn't that what the Greek philosophy was all about? Uh, they were, they were uh, setting up an yes, ideal so. society in, in order to determine how their society could be. Yeah, in a, in a sense, uh, idealism was already with Plato. Yes, very true. Um, I don't think it's a good idea. Many people do it, but I don't think it's a good idea to say that there is a Greek philosophy in general. Uh, I think it's more interesting Sorry. to different uh, periods and thinkers and groups of thinkers than uh, put all kinds of thinkers together. Uh, but yes, there were idealist thinkers uh, close to these uh, thoughts already in, in Greece, in the antique Greece. Well then, it, it, given what you've just said there, Antoine, makes me kind of think, when you kind of stressed about the augmenting the self-determination, which I, that modernity, well, that modernity is the idea, is with the associated idea, idea of augmenting the self-determination, I, I get a bit apprehensive because then it almost feels like a rant um, or that it feels a tiny bit like the politics of Thatcher because it sounds very much like um, the idea of the individual that she put across and the Chicago economists. And that, that I find a bit scary because it's almost yeah. like we need some of the democratic structures that this passage has spoken about as being necessary. Yeah, the, the question is, how do you do we understand augmenting self-determination? Okay. There are several ways to understand it. Uh, so augmenting self-determination goes along with an idea of individualization, for sure. But individualization doesn't necessarily go along with an idea of uh, more selfishness. Okay. It's an, isn't there a, a, a model that uh, as a model of duality? Uh, I, I, I seem to remember, wasn't it? Was it you? I get mixed up because I've done your class and Matt's class, and there's a dialectic uh, sort of model, um, which is a model of how you could go uh, um, as a society or as an individual. And then there's models off of that as well. <laughs> okay. And I'm thinking of when you're talking about this, um, 
I'm, t I'm thinking of that model because it seems very, very close to um, how they would set up that order to be responsive and uh, of a resonant order. And it's everyone working together in that model. It, it came under Plato's and Deleuze, I think. Uh, I'm not sure what the word model. Uh... Uh, it was a diagram to show a dialectic sort of point of view. And it showed a society um, with branching off bits, but also uh, it showed a development of that society. So from the idea to um, uh, several ideas and then how they could be achieved and, and then who was going to do that. It was a whole uh, uh, diagram uh, okay. to do with it. And it looked very similar to the idea of um, adopting a resonant society. <laughs> Well, Deleuze uh, thinks that uh, the conditions of possibility of the apparition of philosophy as we know it uh, are uh, democracy. Uh, because to have philosophy, according to him, you have to have the contest between two people, at least, who are discussing as equals and uh, who are m building arguments uh, and for that to happen you have to have a society of equals it's important to notice of course that the society of equals was made of a few in the antique greece as it was only composed of, of the free men uh, yet uh, maybe indeed there is a a link, uh, essential link between philosophy and democracy. Let's go a bit further in the text that you were reading, uh, Susie. In the words of social philosopher Bernd Ladwig, modern human beings are suffused. With the feeling of their identity as self-legislators, they therefore desire to be able to rationally construct or reconstruct their world as one made by and existing by, for them. They want to be able to understand the structures, institutions and processes of the modern world as embodiments of their reflective will. I'm not quite sure about that word, reflective but will. That's, that's a good desire, right? Mm -hmm. it's, a good, it's much better than a subject who doesn't want to have anything to do with society. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. It, following that oh sorry they, no they they want to uh to make sense with what how the society is built so to understand yeah. institutions etc and so their reflected will uh that's a good point uh, i'm not a specialist of the philosopher uh at all that was mentioned that from which the the quote is uh but i'm thinking that um in a sense, I'm interpreting, I'm not sure, uh, that the, the institutions, the political institutions, etc., are a reflection of the will of the, the citizen. That's what we're supposed it, to, uh, that's, that's what we think. That's what we, we hope to have. <laughs> exactly. Very anyway. good point. That, that, can, can you go a bit further? Following Follow that week's, oh, oh yeah. Following Ludwig's fault, which draws on Habermas as well as Hegel, he, uh, when citizens are able to conceive of themselves, not only as the addresses or recipients of the laws and rules that bind them, but also as their authors, they experience the political administrative order, not only as a heteronious realm, but also as a zone of civic resonance. The massive and often emotional resistance with EU Brussels regulations now, and guidelines. With which EU? With which EU Brussels regulations and guidelines are met 
in thus, in my view, a result of the fact that Europe as a whole, unlike the historically established political, cultural resonance spaces of its... Sorry, my daughter's distracting. Perhaps someone else ought to read that bit. Scott, can you carry on that bit for me? The um, massive. Okay, the massive and often emotional resistance with which EU, inverted commas, Brussels, regulations and guidelines are met is thus, in my view, a result of the fact that Europe as a whole, unlike the historically established political, cultural resonance spaces of its individual states, is not yet perceived as this kind of zone of resonance, regardless of how good or bad said regulations individually may be. Excellent. So the point here, amongst uh, others, is that we can build uh, a sphere of resonance that is political, but it, the one that we live in, in Europe, is not. I think it's, it's not, not we helped. Haven't, we have, I have not achieved that yet. Sorry, you were saying, Scott? Well, it's not helped. Take, take um, I call him Belen Boris, if you're listening and you're watching FUB. Um, for as a as a Telegraph writer, he was a European. He was based in Brussels and always criticised what the EU did. Always said that it, it made uh, bananas bendy and stuff like that, and that's what he is regulating them to be straight bananas. For instance, yeah. The EU is a lot more than that. And I think that text almost indicates it in, in the very last sentence there, regardless of how good or bad said re regulations individually may be, the EU itself, where it falls short, unlike the book Propaganda that I spoke of earlier, they don't blow their own trumpet because the EU in lots of ways at the moment is standing in for the nation state in what it can't do. All the borrowing that is going on to help businesses survive at the moment is probably in a large part coming, is, is backed by the EU you know, for some of the nation states. So it's not all bad. It's just that for some yeah. reason, I think we, we, we perhaps find it easy to conceive of the nation state, you know, like, you know, the, the British flag or the French tricolour, but and what that might mean for people, but it's creating, and perhaps we're doing it in this class by looking at texts like this, that, you know, whether we're talking about the Greeks or, or that there are ideas that are common to Western outlook, or, you know, it doesn't need just to be a Western idea, but there are ideas that bind us together. And, mm -hmm. and if only they made those more resonant, then people would see it more clearly in terms yeah. of doors opening instead of just seeing, you know, one door that's the EU because in Brussels. Yeah, I, I see an irony in that too. Yeah. That whole sentence, I see an irony in because yeah. we, we in Brexit are slacking off, not all of us, but um, there's a, a, a whole sort of criticism of the European common market and um, all the uh, political stuff and, and cultural stuff. And, and because we've now come away from it, I find it ironic that mm -hmm. um, we ended up criticizing exactly what we actually do ourselves and did mm -hmm. ourselves when we were in the European common market. We're doing exactly the same thing as they are doing. Just because we're British, inverted commas, does not mean to say we're different. We've, we've been doing the same practices, the same, you know, stuff. So I find it ironic that, um, you know, we're looking at it in England or not us, but the politicians are trying to put over an argument in Brexit that we're different from what the European uh, common market are going to be doing. No, we're not. We're still going to be manufacturing. We're still going to be importing and exporting and being capitalists and doing all the stuff. You know, we're no different from the European common market. No. But I actually think that you're right about the European common market. I think they've been giving some really good grants to people, which are now lost. 
we've also had we've also had this thing about divide and rule between um, capitalism is awful and politicians because we now have we're losing our cultural um, connections in one way. I know in the equity world, the acting world, loads of actors and actresses have lost their um, jobs that they had in Europe. You know, they they can't do those jobs anymore. Yeah. So that we're losing connections that we had as well, cultural connections, mm -hmm. which is a real shame. And so we're losing our resonance with um, Europe. Yeah, Let, let's I move know. a bit further because I think the most interesting parts of the this chapter are, are coming up. And um, uh, Sneha, would you? Uh, yeah, sure. In my view, however, Haber, Habermas and Ludwig's argument that democracy facilitates citizens' rational comprehension of the collective order and their own stake in it falls short in helping us to adequately understand the functioning of democracy as a collective sphere of resonance. Modern democracy is rather fundamentally based on the idea that its form of politics gives every individual a voice and allows that voice to be heard, such that the politically shaped world thus becomes an expression of this productive polyphony. Ah, so democracy would equal productive polyphony. The idea of modern democracy is to give every individual a voice and allow that voice to be heard, and that can be also uh, called a productive polyphony. Can you read a bit more, uh, Sneha? Yeah. As Nancy Love expressively demonstrates in her book, Musical Democracy, it is no coincidence that the language of democracy is shot through with um, musical metaphors. We speak not only of voices, but of harmony, dissonance, orchestration, discord, working in concert, etc. At the oh, same time... Sorry, just a note about uh, last uh, session. I think last session we mentioned the, the word dissonance several times as uh, something we should avoid. Uh, and I think it's not the word that we should have used because dissonance is used in music and we can actually uh, resonate with dissonance. Dissonance can be very uh, interesting in many ways. And that's why here it's interesting to actually um, insist on the idea of polyphony that we have here that incorporates the idea of dissonance, right? Not all those voices are, are going together harmoniously. And that's a good thing because, uh, or at least it's the idea. It's the idea of the modern democracy. I don't know if it's a good or bad thing, but it's the idea. And but we so, use the word uh, disharmony, don't we? Yeah, disharmony would be uh, maybe better. But what I think was um, what we needed to uh, to see as the enemy, if you will, last time was not so much dissonance, but um, the absence of resonance which we could uh, call, and uh, that's what I tried to say in uh, the introduction, um, uh, alienation or reification, or uh, a way in, in which the, the, the world, be it consonant or dissonant, doesn't make uh, any, um, it has no importance to us anymore. We don't vibrate to it anymore. Uh, yeah, sorry uh, to have interrupted. Uh, you can continue at the same time. At the same time, love makes it clear that the question of how the sphere of democracy is, is shaped and experienced critically depends on which of four possible concepts of the political voice underlies it. In the predominant liberal individualistic conception of politics, one's voice is equated in particular with a vote one casts in an election, 
which is then aggregated with others as a kind of mute voice. The result of this, as shown above, is a mute calculating understanding of politics with few, if any, resonant qualities that transforms the voice of the people into a matter of simple arithmetic, namely the counting up of votes. Ladwig's or Her Habermas's concept of politics, by contrast, recognizes a deliberative, responsible, verbalizing voice aimed at rational argument and the critical examination of interests and positions. As Love argues in connection with William Connolly, because this concept of politics places all its weight on cognition alone, um, being in a, sorry, a way de-esthesized, de-emotionalized, and, dis and thus disembodied. It lacks the visceral, bodily, and sensual qualities implied by the concept of voice that are so important to understanding how democracy actually plays out in practice. Thus, according to Love, it is no coincidence that music plays an important role, not only in how politics is staged and presented, but also in participative civic or democratic life as can be heard in national anthems, workers' songs, protest music, and the various aesthetic expressions of sub subcultures. Love therefore proposes that we conceive of the voice of democracy in a more expansive sense, not simply in terms of votes cast, not, not even as language and speech, but as form of music or song. Only from this perspective can we fully comprehend democracy's resonant quality. Thank you so much. Love therefore proposes, so love is the name of the theorist, therefore proposes that we conceive of the voice of democracy in a more expansive sense, not simply in terms of votes cast, nor even as language and speech, but as a form of music or song. To illustrate uh, this part, I want to uh, um, remind you that uh, indeed, as it said above, not only anthems uh, make people vibrate for political reasons for their for their uh, country. Uh, there are also workers' songs, protest music, etc. That you can uh, uh, remind yourself, such as the uh, famous one called "Bread and Roses," right? You know that song, Bread and Roses? It's used in a documentary that was made on Howard Zinn. You know the great historian Howard Zinn, who wrote a history of, um, of the, the United States uh, through the, the lengths of the people who were fighting uh, for, um, for social rights, um, such as Emma Goldsmith, for instance. Um, uh, so in this documentary, the, the, the song uh, is very beautifully interpreted by women's voices and uh, it's kind of a late motive through the movie that reminds us all those um, decades of uh, fights for uh, civic rights uh, that um, that came before us, and that Scott knows so much about, so so much about, so much more than I do. Oh, I'm sure I don't. But, but I, I, I've got to look at this film. Yeah, the, yeah. The but the, the point I, I'm trying to say is that maybe indeed uh, the the people have to vibrate together, or at least with something of the world, to actually be agents. Uh, political agents that change uh, their conditions. Uh, how would you find the, how would you find the, the energy of doing political things if you don't vibrate uh, musically with, with the world? Musically can be used here uh, literally with such things as uh, protest music, for instance, or uh, as a metaphor, you know, 
uh, music as a metaphor of um, resonance of harmony. Uh, harmony being feeling feeling uh, um, your voice uh, in a, not just as it says this paragraph not just a vote cast and it's mute but your voice being part uh, of a of something bigger than you there was a good example of this yesterday sorry sorry you go first I interrupted uh no problem Scott and I thought it was about patriotism, music. Yeah, pa uh, so the first example giving anthems is clearly about patriotism, but workers' songs, not so much. It, it's more about, about civic rights, right? Yeah. There's a broader context though that Antoine you used right at the end when, when, when you were speaking there uh, about vibrating musically because in the 60s, in the late 60s, and the idea of, you know, the hippie, tune in, drop out and everything, how the big concerts, uh, big concerts, and they pointed to this on BBC4 yesterday. Yeah. And it was, it was, they, they pointed to Woodstock. Yeah. And Woodstock was only, only had a population of 1,000 people, and it was through word of mouth. It wasn't done via... Skype, it wasn't done through multimedia, uh, none of it existed. But more than 500,000 people turned up to that. A lot of them would have been from New York or New York State because that's where it was based. It was mm -hmm. in the middle of New, uh, New York State. And, but uh, Altamont as well, I think is the name, in, in uh, California where Jefferson Airplane and the Stones played. There was almost, mm. a, I think there was an idea then that it never it, that you could be something else and i think it's almost how people can regain that but it almost perhaps because people have been told to be more individual or feel more individualized that politics i think has become far more personally led so mm. there's far more identification i'm not saying it's wrong far from it but if because i, I in fact i'm an equalities officer um for my little uh, branch and not a very good one at that to be honest with you i i do more casework but it the idea that you know if if you're disabled if you're if you're one for, uh, of a minority group or if if it uh, i say minority group i mean it, it if you know women are, are playing an ever greater part and have done since the 60s in 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 uh, trade unions and stuff and, and that's totally right. I just think now, but it's just changed in the way that it, people resonate. It might be that they resonate in a, a smaller cell than what that 60s movement was trying to express. I don't know. Yeah, um, the, the, the author touches on the, such a manifest, pop, pop music as a manifestation of a, a specific period of uh yeah. consciousness through uh th through the music uh yeah. the music being uh, an expression of uh, political con consciousness it's not always the case uh so what i'm saying is that we have to differentiate uh when for instance we have periods of time such as the 60s and the 70s which are uh, seen at least uh, as periods in which the music is very politically engaged and other ones in which the music seems to be only entertainment mm -hmm. uh, we, we can we can for sure say that but yet we can also recognize that in spite of that you have uh, a possibility to read or to perceive politics in terms of music uh, with the idea of uh, this, this whole uh, vocabulary that we use unconsciously in politics, which is musical, mm -hmm. and with concepts that actually make politi politics regain a sense of resonance. Because if you talk about voice, then you tend to think of 
democracy in terms of casting a vote. But if you talk, talk about music, it seems like I was doing last last session. It seems a bit too much because we are not used to do it. Yeah. But if we dare talking about music in terms of politics, uh, then we understand politics as a, a sphere in which it's not just individualism. It's not just uh, okay. an addition of individualities, but uh, a possibility of people working together towards uh, achieving change. Well said. Um, I find it interesting because when we talk about uh, e equality in, in the media, which is uh, one of the fields that I'm involved in, um, although there's um, a lot more equality, there's still a big, big gap. And mm -hmm. even if you talk about the film industry and to make a film, yes, you can use your mobile and stuff. But, you know, there's such things as to actually have connections. You need to be in that world. You need to have, um, I mean, you can make it, but it's harder. It's, it's a bit like the working class and the middle class back in the 60s and 70s. You're always told, yeah, you can make it. And of course you can make it, but it, it's much harder. You know, so yeah. um, there's a lot more work that has to be done. And music was an expression, wasn't it? It, it was definitely an expression and it still is. Now, I mean, I think, I never thought I would say it, but as an older lady now, and listening to my, what I call my 60s, 70s music, yeah. Um, there's so much difference in, um, even down to, there's a lot more diversity now mm -hmm. in music than there was then. You know, we didn't mm -hmm. have raps, we didn't have any of, uh, the music was there, but we never had access to it. Mm -hmm. So there's a word earlier on, which represented communication. It was a lot earlier on in the text. And I think that um, politicians need to communicate more. Okay. They need to have that communication and music gives you that communication. Um, media does to a degree, although it's, um, it's not as diverse as it could be. It still needs to be more diverse. And people who are getting involved need to, especially like internet. I mean, I'm particularly yeah. involved in Brighton in um, who has got access to internet and who hasn't. And that's interesting in itself. If we just take a small bit, we put that against the whole of England or UK or, you know, the world, it will be interesting to know who's actually got accessibility to, you know, to the internet. That's just one example. No, but uh, the very important thing, if, if a source of vibration today uh, is internet, uh, uh, and you you remove, uh, I, I mean, a source of resonance with the of political resonance. Sorry, uh, and I'm you, glad you said that because there's also spiritual resonance as well. <laughs> for you don't need the internet. <laughs> yeah, I don't think uh, the spiritual resonance is so much on internet, but that is discussable. Yeah. But I think I think you can make a point that political resonance can be achieved through internet these days. And uh, the fact that people don't have access to it is a problem that's really big indeed. Uh, let's go a bit further, maybe with James reading the next paragraph. Okay. As I saw. Yeah. As I sought to demonstrate in chapter 3.2, music as a medium is characterized by the fact that it allows and even suggests modulating, moderating, and transforming one's own relationship to the world in aesthetic terms. If we can so see- chapter 3.2 was actually what we studied last time. If we can see with the democratic process- When we studied- Go James. Go ahead. Yeah. If we can, can, if we can see the democratic process in this way as a form of music, we can understand it as the continued modulation and moderation of both our collective relationship to the world and our own role within this relationship. Democracy then becomes a living sphere of resonance in which subjects make themselves heard, but are but also are touched and transformed by the singing of others. 
The music of social movements reveals and releases new energies from a resonant civil society. Its call and response mode combines individuality and community, spontaneity and structure, and mirrors radical democratic processes. George Kateb. Continue, please. Yeah. Okay. George Kateb. George Kateb likewise suggests that this sort of democratic aestheticism makes it possible for citizens' political relationships to the world to become resonant, arguing that it endures receptivity. Endures, sorry. Receptivity or responsiveness to as much of the world as possible, its persons, its events and situations, its conditions, its patterns and sequences. Democracy here no longer denotes merely or even primarily the negotiation and settlement of legal claims and conflicts of interests, or rather refers to an ongoing process of becoming more sensitive to a variety of voices and the sense of perspectives, modes of existence and relationships to the world. Excellent. Go, go, go further. This concept of democratic politics is perhaps most powerfully expressed in the writings of Hannah Arendt, who is more so, who, more so than love or Kateb, emphasises the self-efficacy involved in resonant action in terms of shaping and adaptively transforming the world. For Arendt, the voice of the democratically active citizen is genuinely musical in the sense described above, as can be seen in her essay, Culture and Politic, in which she explicitly states that political action is concerned with how the world, qua world, should look and sound, how it should see and hear itself, collectively politically generating resonance in this way, not only transforms, but even first generates the world, Arendt argues. Guaranteeing that we who do not come from the desert, but live in it, are capable of transforming the desert into a human world. So the desert here is a, a metaphor, uh, and it's it's a metaphor that goes well with the idea of uh, muteness, or the idea of too much noise as well, when the when the absence of resonance, if you will, uh, the the city can be considered a desert, a social desert, if people don't talk to each other anymore, if. Uh, if we are delivered things and staying on our screens, etc., all the time. And so there's this idea, the form of idealism in Anna Arendt, that we are capable of transforming the de desert in which we are into a human world. So the idea that the world we live in is not yet human, according to a uh, uh, well, she's someone who says that uh, after the, the Second World War, that the, some context can help understanding her statement. Uh, interestingly, uh, contemporary research on happiness, so you see resonance is indeed a way of dealing with this most famous, more famous and most famous concept in philosophy, which is happiness. Resonance, if you will, is um, an elaboration on what happiness, on how happiness can be understood. Uh, interestingly, contemporary research on happiness offers credible empirical evidence that there is a direct correlation between human beings' satisfaction with life and their ability to participate in democratic politics. And what matters here is not so much output, individual satisfaction with the outcomes of political action, as input being included in the political process. As the Swiss economist Frey sums it up, residents of countries with widespread democratic institutions are fundamentally more satisfied with their lives than those otherwise living under the same conditions. The happiness effect of democracy is therefore considerable. Do you Electro think that Sweden's an example of that or not? Very good example. Which example? Sweden. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so. I don't know very well, but I'm, I think that Scandinavian countries, even though they are not models of reception of um, people who are in exile, uh, they are good examples of working democracies. There's quite a lot of different studies in Sweden of, of housing, of uh, suicide, of drug rates, uh, uh, of economics, of, of uh, employment and stuff, and also play and social stuff. And a lot of them are very favourable towards Sweden on the uh, country scale. And um, if we think about what they've done in COVID, it's quite interesting because yeah, what yeah. came to my mind, yeah, well, what came to my mind is that they trust their government. Mm -hmm. You know, they trust, even if things are going pretty badly, they still trust their government. Yeah, they see, they see um, uh, the government as a reflection of their will to come back yeah, to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. As opposed to what we, you know, in England, I don't see the government as a reflection to my will. Mm -hmm. But can I just add to both of you that Sweden itself has a population of around five or six million, despite the fact that it's quite a big country in terms of land mass. Yeah. But also the history of Sweden is, is a tiny bit different. I think the elites got in met uh, the elites of, say, 100, 150 years ago uh, and the state are more. Uh, uh, it, there's I think it's more fused in a strange way. And yeah. and and this, I, I can't really explain it. Um, I think they're more at one with the capitalistic system that they've got, and they see less wrong with it. And I think the outcomes. You're right. I think in terms of equalities across the board, as you mentioned about all the studies, it's more that they normally come out as being quite high. And Although I think in the last 10 years or so, the politics have, have, have moved a tiny bit more to the right. They're always more um, socially with it than, than ourselves. Yes and no, because um, I've been to Denmark quite a lot um, over the years. And what I get in, uh, from what I can gather from Swedish mm -hmm. people, is there's quite a lot of racism there as well. You spoke you about know, two different countries there, didn't you? No, no I, from the Swedish people that I've met. Because when I go to Denmark, I meet all sorts of people from all over the world. And the Swedish people that I've talked to, because this came about when I used to work on adventure playgrounds and, and uh, they had a wonderful way of, of play, inventive, creative way of yeah. playing. And, um, uh, but there is quite a lot of racism. Um, so when yeah. you say changed, it's interesting to know how they've changed. I You're don't right. know how they've changed. But well, you've it, just said it. You've just said it. I think there are more instances of that. But perhaps then they have received, under the EU, for instance, they've received more refugees than we ever did or encouraged to have or turned so back. It's so interesting that you're talking about this example because this, this is the best possible introduction to the next paragraph with, 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 will, with which we will end the, the, this session. <laughs> and I, I can give the first sentence as a proof of what I just advanced. Conceiving of democratic politics in this way as a vital sphere of resonance for modernity makes clear that it is not aimed at negating its own diversity through the establishment of in identity, sorry, I can't say that word, identitarian harmony. So indeed, I don't know so much about um, Sweden, so I won't talk about Sweden, uh, but it seems like that Denmark is doing very, very well in many ways, yet there are, uh, acceptance of people from other countries is very very low yeah and, there's a and, lot of there's a lot of uh because of the diversity at the moment there's a lot of uh fear mm -hmm. they have actually established uh their um democracy and uh, there's there's re their resonance if you will uh by building a identitarian harmony. 
uh, it's a good example of that. I don't know so much about Sweden. You were saying something similar about Sweden, but let's go a bit further in the paragraph. Someone else reads it, Scott? Yeah, sorry. As noted above, resonance, and in quotes, even at the ethnological level, close quotes, precisely does not mean harmony or consonance, but rather refers to a process of responding, moving, touching, particularly in the realm of... <laughs> this also involves resounding disagreement, and here our theory of resonance is concerned precisely with the distinction between this form of contradiction and the mute resistance against petrified conditions that seems to have become the dominant mode of late modernity. A resonance theory of democracy thus moves between the associative and dissociative concepts of the political, respectively advanced by Oliver Marchand and, uh, and Hannah Arendt and by Carl Schmitt. With its emphasis on contradiction, viscerality and a diversity of voices, resonance theory tends towards the, the dissociative view, yet with its notion of sounding together or moving responsive relationships, it also embraces the associative Republican vision of common action and the productive adaptive transformation of public spheres and institutions. Full stop. Well, that's, uh, thank you. That's a rather complex paragraph. Yeah, can you explain it? Yeah. <laughs> that we can comment a little bit on. So the idea first is that resonance is not just harmony or consonance, which was kind of the trap we fell into last time when we were commenting on music as uh, a way to establish uh, resonance. Uh, but rather, I'm just reading here, rather refers to a process of responding, moving, touching. Responding, moving, touching. So we can think of responding in two ways in music. Uh, we can think of, oh, the audience is responding emotionally to the players, musicians. And we can think also in jazz, you know, there's this mode of a question and response when uh, one player plays something and the other one on the on the guitar one guy plays something and on the piano the other one responds something so that's Damn the idea also, yeah the idea of building something together and you can use dissonance as a tool you can say oh i create something you to surprise you or to go in a different direction etc etc so yet yet with this idea of creating something different of having a different voice saying something else you can still have resonance because you can still play in that sphere together and respond to each other so what, that's what is called resounding disagreement. So instead of saying, if you will, uh, such people should not belong to our country because they, are, uh, they have a different religion. Uh, it has happened in Burma, for instance, with the Muslim community there, the Rohingyas. Uh, and in many countries with different communities, mostly Muslims, I'm, I must notice. Uh, some Christians as well. Um, so instead of saying you don't belong here because we have created a country that's based on an identity, how was it said uh, just above? Identitary uh, something? Yeah. Um, instead of saying my country is based on this principle and that's how we make things resonate because we are the same, uh, which is what the, the Rosa calls a bit below an echo chamber, 
when the same responds to the same, such as in the Nazi regime when the, the, the identity was made by the exclusion of otherness. Here, in this model of resonance, we accept otherness as a good thing, as difference between uh, being, being expressed, and that has to be ex expressed and um, appreciated as such to make democracy. Uh, it's interesting because Canada does that, but there's one thing I noticed after living in Canada, I realized that although uh, they open up their arms, with their own First Nation, they're quite racist. <laughs> and yeah, yet, but sorry, Susie, you just used Canada, but then, then I, I, I was thinking that that could be where difference is made to make democracy in terms of that multiculturalism. I, ex I accept that the First Nation thing isn't perfect, but you've got a bilingual country, or at least in two provinces where since the 60s it's become officially bilingual, as in I think it's New Brunswick, and I don't know if Manitoba. Quebec. Quebec. Yeah, yeah, but I think, yeah, you're right. So I lived in, I lived in uh, near Montreal, yeah. Yeah, so did I, but slightly further up. But it, it it's... Um, yeah, I'll let you speak, Susie, because you wanted to go further in this. Susie? Um, yeah, it, it was just because of what you were saying about resounding disagreements. That was really interesting because um, I feel somewhere like Canada, um, that's not the case. They don't. I mean, they're obviously resounding disagreements and everything, but in in the way of culture, there isn't. Apart from the First Nation, in parts of Canada, not all of it. So it it comes down to culture and attitude as well, and education. Yeah, I, I personally, I would say um, I'm not going to use your example of Kennedy because I saw a documentary on him that made me hate him, uh, where you understand how the family worked, etc. Not Kennedy, Canada. 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 Uh, Canada. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't understanding what was cut was saying. <laughs> Canada. OK. No, no, Kennedy. <laughs> Oh, I'm relieved. Thank you. Canada. V very good. Uh, do I have ideas about Canada? I'm not sure. But what I'm trying to say is, as you were uh, saying, Susie, that uh, in the beginning that, that you brought the idea of dialectics, um, here with contradiction, we have a key concept of dialectics. And here we have a paradigm that says on one side contradiction, on the other side mute or muteness. And the good thing being contradiction, the bad thing mute. When you kill people, they are mute. When you force them to exile, they are mute, et cetera, et cetera. When you, um, when you tolerate or even um, um, value contradiction, you are in a, a uh, political process of dialectics, which is the same root as dialogue. And in the dialogue, you have dia, which is difference, and logos, the, the voice or the, the, the speech and the, the intelligence, the reasoning. Uh, so contradiction is important to value. Yet you can also argue and so I'm contradicting my praise of contradiction by saying that contradiction is maybe not the best value uh, by saying that, yes, but not as itself, contradiction to build something, contradiction not to remain in contradiction. And that's the idea of dialectics. It, uh, it's and there's several ways to understand dialectics, of course, but a, a, a general idea of dialectics outside even of Hegel or theory, it's the idea that you go beyond contradiction 
you and you don't go beyond contradiction by erasing contradiction but by understanding contradiction yes is this platonic um, dialectic or which dialectic or is it just general one well i was talking about uh, platonic it, all right it is a little bit Platonic dialectic in the sense that, yes, already in Plato, you have those dialogues in which um, there are people contradicting each other. Yes, mostly in uh, Plato's dialogues, which I don't read again and again, I should, but I don't. Um, the, the, there's mostly one character whose name we all know, Socrates, who always kind of feels what's right and guides the other guy or the other guys towards what's right. So it's not really the best uh, representation of dialectics. Maybe um, there are some dialogues, um, the one called in French, the ban Le Banquet, I always forget the name of it in English, it's a beautiful name. It's when you have your team that talks about love and um, uh, let's never mind. And uh, so you have I, already in Plato, you have the root of that. Uh, people contradicting each other and going beyond contradiction. They find myth, they find, uh, they build ideas together. And um, so you have that in, such, in some of the dialogues. But what I was using a little bit, even though I said I wasn't, was Hegelian theory of dialectics, which is, um, a position, its contradiction, and through the understanding of the contradiction of the the, the what ties the position to the contradiction, uh, something that goes above them. Um, yeah, it's called in. Unfortunately, uh, I have in, to go. I'm sorry. Yeah, bye bye. There, there's a name for it in in German. Oh. What do you know the name for it in German? No. Aufbung, Aufbung, which means um, how how would you translate that in English? There are several ways. I would say it's to overcome the overcoming of a contradiction. Do you think you could put the link of what you just said, uh, uh, that French di uh, dialogue of love, into Fab? The, the French is the one by Plato. That's the symposium. The symposium. I can I can no, uh, give you the, the link for. No, the one that you Which one? quoted in French. Uh, you said there's a better example of love in French. He called it. He called it le, bo le banquet, which is the symp the the oh. symposium. He yeah, just. Yeah, yeah. It was oh, the... okay. It's the same. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. the contradiction. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. so I, I totally. want to go to go. Uh, I want to uh, salute all of you, and uh, I don't want Susie to leave us and not participate to the end. So let's let's say bye bye. I, I oh. want to I want to make another uh, session next week. Brilliant. On which we will oh. focus on uh, the. <sighs> on the chapter that I said was a piece of cake, but I couldn't find it in English for you. If one of you want to buy the book Resonance, that would be great because you would have it. And also you could uh, make PDFs for us using PDF scan on your do phone. You think, do you think you could um, send me the link? I think I will buy it because I'm really interested in that word. Yes, yet. <laughs> I don't want you to buy it through uh, uh, Amazon, and so I can buy, I can uh, uh, send you a link for the book, but I don't know on which platform you would buy it. Okay, well just leave it to uh -huh. me, and I'll buy it on whatever's yeah. easiest for me. And, yeah. and have you got a scanner, or if not, I might have a scanner at work, but it won't go very particularly quickly. But just so well, maybe, you... maybe Scott, if you send me your address, okay. Yeah. And then when I buy it, I'll send it to you so that you can scan it because I haven't got, I've just put my printer in for repair, so. But there's something easier than scanning with a scanner. There's something which is an app 
an app on your phone called um, Adobe Scan, for instance, or another app. And with okay. your phone, it does it so well and so quickly that I recommend that over a scanner. Okay. I Adobe do my, Scan. Adobe Scan is works really well. Okay, well, I'm on, I'm on the Adobe thing because I do editing, so I'll have a look, see if they can get me a Adobe scan. Okay, yeah. Susie, I'll put my email up there. I'm not saying that I'm particularly good with the scanner and getting it out to everybody, so you might be better off trying to use the the mobile phone version, but I'll put my email up there anyway, all right? Otherwise, I'll take photos. <laughs> yeah, however well, you do it, that might I'm be fine. But actually, photos are, are, are it's, it's longer. It's longer to make photos and turn it into a PDF or just sending the photos. It's easier and shorter to to use uh, such an app as Adobe Scan. Um, so thank you very much for your participation. Next time we'll talk about this chapter that I mentioned, the one that is a piece chapter of cake, and about education. Uh, if if it's uh, if we succeed in concluding, it might be the last one. If we all want more, we might do more, but we can also make it the last one. Uh, I'd like more. You spend the whole of Christmas doing it. Yeah? I can. I can. <laughs> Sounds great. Sounds great. I don't think okay. my daughter would let me. <laughs> Thank you so very I'm much, everyone. The participation was excellent today. Uh, you, so too bad Jilly wasn't here, but. I hope she'll come. I, I'm sad Niall doesn't make it, but because he was a great participant. Um, anyway, thank you very much. Have a wonderful night. Yeah, you too. Cheers on Twitter. Bye. Bye, James. Bye bye. Bye, see you. Bye. See you, James. Bye. See you all. Bye. Bye, Tom. Bye. 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 bye.